Hi everyone, I'm Gautam Kumar and I'm joined by Nandita Dukipati. We are from Google and are going to present Swift Congestion Control. And we aim to convince you all that delay is simple and effective for congestion control in the data center. So what is Swift? In one line, albeit a long one, Swift is a delay-based congestion control for data centers that achieves low latency, high throughput, near zero loss, implemented completely at end hosts, supporting diverse workloads like large-scale in-cast across latency-sensitive, byte, and IOPS-intensive applications, working seamlessly in heterogeneous data centers with minimal switch support. The different keywords here highlight the requirements of an effective and deployable congestion control at scale as they have come about over the course of Swift's deployment at Google. Swift achieves near 50 microseconds stale latency for short flows while maintaining near 100% utilization even at line rates of 100 Gbps and beyond. So why did we build a new data center congestion control at Google? I, I would like to highlight three key reasons here. We have new applications with low latency requirements. Flash needs 100 microseconds of access latency at 100k plus IOPS. NVM needs 10 microseconds of access latency at 1 million plus IOPS. We have large scale in-cast, which is typical of partition aggregate workloads, and we have IOPS intensive applications, for example, BigQuery Shuffle. We have new stacks and new sources of congestion. For example, Pony Express, which is a stack we published at SOSP of 2019, exhibits congestion behavior, which is no longer limited to the fabric. In case of Pony Express, endpoint congestion is key because it's designed for CPU efficiency. We have increasing line rates, 100 Gbps and beyond. And what this means is that we need to react to congestion very quickly because queues can build up very quickly. In addition, congestion control needs to be robust to heterogeneity and tying congestion control to switch internals has proved a maintenance burden. Let me highlight a few key design aspects of Swift. Swift is based on delay. In the diagram here, I provide an end-to-end -end delay decomposition of a packet and its app. And we can see that it spends some time in the NIC, RX, and TX queues, and some time in the fabric via the forward path and the reverse path. The way Swift operates is it maintains a congestion window in packets. In fact, we maintain two windows, one for the fabric and one for the endpoint. And the effective congestion window is the minimum of these two. These two congestion windows are controlled using a simple AIMD based on target delay. If the measured delay is less than the target, we increase the congestion window additively, otherwise we decrease the congestion window multiplicatively. How we measure the delay is via the use of hardware and software timestamps. The details of timestamping, the packet header changes, how we exactly measure the delay, and how we decompose it into its underlying components are all in the paper. Swift seamlessly transitions between CWIND and RATE. We paste packets when the CWIND falls below 1 using a timing wheel, but we do not paste packets when the CWIND is above 1. And what we have realized from our experience is that always on pacing is largely unnecessary for effective performance at scale, and this aspect of Swift aids CPU efficiency. The target delay that Swift uses is not static. In the diagram here, we, have, we can see that a flow traverses edge hops and can contend with end flows at the bottleneck link. So we scale the target dynamically based on the topology to provide RTT, scareness, RTT fairness, and we also do flow-based scaling to account for random collisions which, which are not due to congestion. Happily, we have not invested much in loss recovery because losses in Swift are extremely rare. We use SAC for fast recovery and an RTO mechanism in the cases where we cannot do fast recovery, for example, when acts get lost. Swift is deployed at Google in heterogeneous deployments. We have WAN, which is using its own congestion control, and we have cloud traffic, where cloud customers get to use the CC of their choice. To isolate Swift traffic, we leverage cost queue features, which are available in most commercial switches. We reserve a subset of cost queues solely meant for Swift traffic. With this, I would hand off to my co-presenter, Nandita. Thank you, Gautam. In the next few slides, I will walk you through our key experiences with deploying Swift, the main questions that we received as part of the reviews, and then conclude with future research directions. 
We deployed Swift in production at Google, where it supports a range of applications, including reads and writes from story traffic, as well as an in-memory file system used for BigQuery Shuffle. Taken together, the traffic is a mix of throughput-intensive workload in terms of bytes per second, IOP intensive and some latency-sensitive traffic. Our conclusions in the paper are based on the analysis of three kinds of data. First are SWIFT statistics that inform us of link utilization and packet loss rates. Second are round-trip time and fabric latency as measured at the hosts with hardware timestamps. And just as importantly, third are the application-level metrics that teach us the impact of SWIFT on applications. Our main point of comparison in the paper is a DCTCP style congestion control that we'll henceforth refer to as GCN. This slide shows you a sliver of the data in the paper where we focus on network level metrics on packet loss and fabric latency. The left hand plot shows the loss versus utilization. One of the biggest improvements as we moved traffic to Swift was the reduction in packet loss rate over two plus orders of magnitude, lower average and tail loss rates relative to GCN across a range of utilizations, including uh, on links with greater than 90% utilization. The right-hand plot shows the fabric latency versus utilization across our clusters. We can see that Swift is able to maintain the average fabric latency around the configured target delay at scale. The average latency matches really well the base target delay used in our deployments, and this specific behavior has proven to be extremely useful as we lowered the target delay over the full course of our deployment. This change was done incrementally and carefully, ensuring that we did not cause any regression to our application performance as we navigate the latency throughput curve. The paper provides details on the impact of SWIFT on application level performance. So in summary, we draw several conclusions from our experiences. First and foremost, delay works really well. Using delay as a congestion signal, we can realize very simple congestion control that achieves excellent performance for data center workloads. We particularly find that the use of absolute target delay is performant and robust, not just for application performance, but also for operational purposes. Second, it is important to respond to both fabric and host congestion. We initially underestimated congestion at the hosts, but all kinds of congestion matter in order to provide excellent end-to-end -end application performance. Delay is readily decomposable for this purpose. The paper has data showing the importance and outcome of such a delay decomposition. Third, Swift's design based on delay is able to support a wide range of traffic patterns, including some very large scale in-casts. The paper details in-cast results from 5,000 flows to a single machine and shows how Swift maintains low loss and latency without sacrificing throughput. We address next two main categories of questions raised during the course of the reviews. The first category of questions were around the reasons for Swift outperforming GCN, as well as the key differences between Swift and Timely, which we've now detailed in the paper. The second category of questions were around the ease of deployment and specifically the overhead of using NICS timestamps. Modern NICS widely support hardware timestamps that are accessible from host networking stacks, including Pony Express and Kernel TCP. We've included CPU usage numbers that provide evidence that the overhead of obtaining timestamps is very reasonable. And now, a few remarks on future research. First, the multiple opportunities to improve upon SWIFT itself, such as faster convergence on bursty or transient congestion, as well as developing theoretical frameworks for exploring and advancing the control loop dynamics. Besides that, the multiple directions for future research such as building highly portable and transport agnostic congestion control for public clouds. We also believe that delay is useful for controlling higher level operations such as RPCs or RMAs, as shown in the one RMA paper being presented in this conference. And then finally, in order to achieve ultra low latency for short transfers that match the raw propagation delay in data centers in the presence of higher bandwidth flows, we will require newer techniques. And with that, I want to thank everyone today for tuning in to the talk on SWIFT. 
Uh, thank you. There are a lot of questions flowing in. I'm going to bypass some of the questions because I, I, I want to take this opportunity to ask one first question. So Gotham's first slide. Um, it seems like, so thank you for outlining all the research directions, but it seems like that first slide tells us that everything has been solved. You can achieve low latency, you can achieve 100% utilization and low latency at the same time. You can handle heterogeneous workloads. Uh, and while Nandita talks about low latency, 10 microseconds, less than 10 microsecond uh, question in future, uh, I'm curious really, what is the fundamental problem that's really left in data center condition control? And you know, I'll, I'll request Nandita uh, or Gotham to, to answer exactly this. So what is the real fundamental problem that's left? Sure. Okay. Uh, I, I can take this on, uh, Rajit. I think uh, partly uh, I alluded to it uh, in the future work directions. I believe that with SWIFT, we've shown uh, a certain level of load latencies. I know that we haven't included some absolute numbers from production, but the experiments do show latencies as low as 50 microseconds. However, um, that's still far from the propagation delay in data centers, right? Intra-rack propagation delay is within five microseconds, and even within a superblock, it's much lower than 50 microseconds. I think actually being able to sustain uh, high bandwidth while attaining that ultra-low latency for very short transfers close to the propagation delay, I do think actually uh, still remains an open item. And in my mind, uh, it's not entirely clear whether an entirely reactive-based scheme can actually get us uh, very close to the propagation delay. Um, but, you know, but the point where we are at is, you know, 50 microseconds is something uh, or uh, is something that is uh, achievable. What kind of applications now can make use of this latency, right? And this goes back to uh, how can we actually unlock this potential and uh, make it directly, this low latency directly usable to higher level applications? I think that is uh, an interesting question as well. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, I will continue along, uh, you know, uh, bypassing all the many questions that are being asked, but I want to make one comment from the Slack channel. Vishal says that the future direction of fluid model sounds really interesting. He knows exactly the guy who can help you understand that problem. Uh, of course, he's talking about Vishal uh, from Colombia. Um, I want to go back to your answer. So I think you talked about the problem of getting low latency, really low latency, the best possible latency while achieving high utilization. So I want to dig deeper into that. Has that not been the core challenge always in condition control? And if I look at all the last 10 years of work, aren't we just continuing to make new trade-offs where we give up either latency or we give up either throughput and continue to improve or find new operating points? And where do we stop making these trade-offs? Yeah, uh, th that's a great question. I think a part of the thing that we intended to come out in the paper is that um, simplicity matters in congestion control. And if we are able to, and, and what you know, was shown in the paper essentially is with a simple congestion control, uh, this is how far it can actually take us, uh, right? About 100 gigabits per second, 50 microseconds, and, and we can go even lower. But uh, I, I want to dwell on that question a little bit more. Like really how far can simplicity take us? And at what point do we, actually start need to introducing more complexity or uh, uh, either in terms of in with support or in terms of centralized controllers, which I'm a great fan of, by the way. Uh, but I want to know what is the delta that that is going to buy us in practice uh, at scale, right? Um, so, so yes, it's, it's a problem that uh, has been worked on, uh, but I think we are at a point where we want to understand which of these schemes can get us those properties at scale in a simple way. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, again, follow up with the, my own questions. There are a lot of interesting questions being asked. I wanna take five years down uh, to where we are today, right? Five years from now. 
I assume that we are going to move from 100 to 1.4 terabit links, and I want to take the opportunity that we have you in front of the entire community to see how you see things evolving from Swift five years down the line. Are we going to see Swift++ plus plus or are we going to see a completely new way of designing condition control protocols for uh, you know, very, very high speed links, let's say 1.4 terabit links, where BDP is basically much, much higher than Swift buffer capacity for even a small end cast? Yeah, the, that's a great question. I personally, what I would like to see in the space is actually us uh, my interpretation of congestion control is broader than a per flow congestion control as we know it in as in TCP or even in the RDMA setting. My interpretation of congestion control is anywhere where there is greater demand than supply, there is congestion and we need some sort of congestion control. It doesn't have to be a five tuple congestion control, right? Um, what I would like us to see is actually move higher up in the stack, think about it from the application point of view. Uh, what does it really take uh, to deliver end-to-end -end excellent uh, application level performance? I think we've done a lot of work on sort of the layer three per flow congestion control, but what does it mean to higher level entities, right? Why should we do always, why should congestion control be always be done at layer three? After all, applications have a lot more information on what matters to them. What does it actually mean on moving some of this to the application layer? So that's the kind of work that uh, uh, I think would be interesting actually to see, to make it matter to the applications, um, even as we keep moving to higher speeds, et cetera. Perfect. I'll, add that I'll uh, continue to take questions on Swift design details and implementation of Slack. So, Perfect. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm being, uh, uh, people are beating me up for taking, hijacking the Q&A, but uh, in that interest, I will ask one question from Aditya, um, which is kind of related to your last comment, Nandita. Do we necessarily need to tailor the set of metrics to the specific settings like van or data centers or mobile, or do you see the different condition control protocols converging to something more unified over time? Well, Gautam, go ahead, take, take this question, uh, please. That sounds good. Uh, yes, that's a great question, uh, Aditya. And uh, I, I think uh, over the long course of time, we, we can think of metrics which are common uh, across data centers and WAN. For example, one of the comments, as you actually point out in the paper uh, that we make, is that well, it is, while it is easy to uh, figure out if congestion control is not working well, and we'll see it via increased losses, increased latency, Terrible application network performance, it is not easy to determine if congestion control is working to its absolute best. Uh, and I think that is one metric that can be unifi unified across data center congestion control and van congestion control. That is congestion control doing the best it can do. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Gautam and Anita. That was a great presentation. Uh, so if you both can turn on the videos, uh, we can start our QA. Uh, so, okay, we already have some questions on Slack. Uh, so, the first question is why is Swift better than DC, TCP, or GCN in high degree in cast? Hi, uh, I'll take this question. Uh, thank you, Wei, for your question. Uh, this is a great question. And, and in fact, in the paper, we, uh, and uh, this, this point was also raised in the reviews. Uh, and now we have included in the paper detailed results on the comparison in large scale in cast specifically. 5,000 to one in cast. Uh, and what we observed with GCN was that, uh, that we observed very high losses, which drive the throughput down. Whereas uh, Swift losses, latency and throughput were uh, all uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, now, one may ask that, uh, can, can we achieve similar performance with say DCTCP if we lower the ECN threshold marking to a very small value? Perhaps yes, but uh, then it goes into the question of tuning ECN thresholds to work under different variety of, uh, of workloads. Great. Uh, so the next question is, how do you deal with artificial delay inflations due to delayed hacking? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and actually we talk about this in the paper. So we do not explicitly delay hacks in Swift. Uh, so what this means is that, uh, that, that doesn't mean that we have no delayed hacks. Uh, for example, in our deployment in Pony Express, acts can get delayed because Pony Express processes packets in batches. 
but Swift does not explicitly delay apps. Uh, one can imagine uh, that for hardware offloaded transports, uh, we can still use a very small coalescing uh, interval. But, but yeah, the high level idea is that we want as pristine RTT and delay measurements as we can, and therefore we do not uh, 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 reside on using delayed acts. Uh, so there was uh, another question related to the in-cast question, which I missed. Uh, so the question is, if you have 5,000 flows in an in-cast and they're all coming together, what, what is, uh, basically are they all coming together and what is the initial window? Is it equal to the bandwidth delay product? Yes, so that's a, that's a great question, and I think it goes back to the the kind of the mental model around how uh, flows are set up, right? So, for example, if these were five thousand short RPCs that in, this just started at the same time, we'll not be able to uh, respond to them, right? But in practice, what ends up happening is that we have long running flows, and RPCs are scheduled on on top of them. So, uh, so. Uh, we, we have the latest, greatest state of congestion for these flows. Uh, but yeah, if, uh, if you could imagine an experiment where we have our 5,000 RPCs starting on separate flows all at once, uh, that might cause, uh, cause an issue, but it's not a problem in practice. Uh, actually, I had a follow-up question on that. So if you're sort of remembering the state from like the past RPCs, couldn't that be like stale? So let's say you compute some congestion window, but then like, you know, there's a new R RPC that starts after like a few milliseconds, a few seconds, like, wouldn't that be like stale information? Do you still use uh, that? that? That's a great question. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the things we actually tried was uh, to the effect of uh, idle, sorry, reset after idle. So if you observe that a flow, for example, has been idle for some time, will reset its congestion control state. But, uh, but it is a little bit workload dependent. At Google, we did not find that it provided uh, any benefit uh, because um, we have quite a lot of traffic. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. then the next question is, uh, is the sevent growth and decrease proportional to the measured delay? Like the only AIMD was mentioned in the slides, I guess. So. Uh, can you repeat the question? I... Is the sevent growth and decrease proportional to the measured delay? So the additive increase part is not the is not proportional to the delay. Uh, so the additive increase part is that we are going to raise the C wind by this additive increase factor uh, uh, over the course of an RTT. The multiplicative decrease part is dependent on how far we are from the target, and the exact uh, algorithm is there in the paper. Uh, okay. So another question is: uh, Do you use Swift for RDMA congestion control? Mm -hmm. Uh, Nita, do you want to take this question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I can take the question. Uh, yes, yeah, Swift is used uh, for both RMAs and uh, RPCs. Uh, the context in which we describe Swift in the paper was in the context of Pony Express in uh, Snap, uh, which is a user space networking stack. So is burning CPU cores to run congestion control an issue for RDMA? Would it so, the benefit of RDMA? It's actually a great question. Uh, I think, you know, burning CPU cores um, uh, to run host networking, if, if a host networking stack such as Pony Express is already burning CPU cores in order to transport packets in and out, congestion control is a part of the host networking stack. And what we've measured is essentially the percentage of CPU that congestion control itself takes of the entire CPU taken, uh, used by Pony Express, and that percentage was very reasonable. And it also goes back to uh, the point that we were trying to make in the paper that simplicity is, is key. We found it to be a virtue because when you have a simple congestion control that works, you actually don't need a whole lot of CPU cycles to make it work well. Uh, so, what are the scaling limits of doing congestion control in software? I guess it's a related question. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. Uh, so, um, so in terms of scaling limits, it's actually a great point. I think the scaling scaling limits would be the precision with which you're able to um, uh, measure the uh, accurate uh, timestamps. We use hardware timestamps, but in order to disambiguate 
the host delays and fabric delays. It's a combination of hardware and software timestamps. So uh, we, we do uh, actually mention that we have some experiments where we, when, when we do it in, um, uh, in, in non-software based uh, uh, stacks, right, we can actually get even uh, further precision that we have in detail much in the paper, but it is, uh, it is possible. I wonder if that is the kind of scaling limits the question is alluding to. I believe so. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think they are typing a follow up on it. Okay, in the meantime, I'll ask another question. Uh, so this question is up. So uh, there exists some work that buffers acts on the switch. And will this kind of behavior that is outside switch control, would it impact the performance? Gautam, do you want to take that? Hmm? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, can you can you explain what does it mean by buffers acting on the switch? I believe it means that acknowledgement packets are buffered in the switches as opposed to being delivered right away. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe that is what they mean. So yeah. So yeah, something like reverse path congestion right. or something. So so that is a, that is a that is a great question, and we actually uh, talk about this in the talk as well, right? So uh, in Swift, we are not uh, prioritizing path. Uh, act packet uh, on separate queues uh, because if we do that, we we lose act coalescing, and then we have to process much more packets at the end host act, which uh, directly impact the CPU efficiency that we are aiming for. Right? Uh, in in practice, what we have found is that since the reverse path traffic is also controlled by Swift, it keeps the delay low, and we do not uh, see the uh, the effects of reverse versus forward path congestion uh, in uh, having a great impact. But uh, we are looking forward to uh, measuring one-way delays using uh, synchronized clocks, uh, using sojourn time-based ECNs, or uh, in-network telemetry to uh, augment uh, delay, uh, to augment Swift algorithm to handle this case. Okay. Uh, so Nick, one last question from my end. Uh, so I'm just curious. So I, I kind of appreciate the uh, simplicity of delay as a congestion signal, of course. Uh, but I'm curious, like, have you considered like other alternative designs, like credit-based flow control that can very tightly control the amount of uh, delay, like directly or like, you know, sort of SRPT kind of schemes, like P fabric or a simplification of P fabric that's much more deployable. Like, have you considered such schemes and like, why did you discard them? Or uh, I, I, can, I can take this question. So, so that's a that's a great question, Radhika. And to answer the two specific examples you pointed out, I think. The two main things that uh, we, we have definitely considered many designs uh, in at Google, um, and the the issue with credit based schemes is tends to be that you need processing power for processing the credits, right? Mm -hmm. And as we target CPU efficiency, that becomes uh, a problem. Uh, with respect to the fabric, uh, I think the question becomes that uh, 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 it's. First, uh, I believe uh, uh, it, there is not a simple answer to deploying it in a shared infrastructure where not all traffic can be the fabric. Uh, and secondly, um, I think uh, there are some uh, corner cases of communication patterns where, uh, uh, where it doesn't work so well. And uh, what is nice about Swift is that because it is simple to reason about, we, we know that it is going to be robust under any sort of communication pattern we see in our data centers. Right. That's a great answer. And if I may just add uh, to the great answer that Gautam said, I think uh, all this work on P Fabric, uh, Homa, P Host, actually a very inspiring work. And they inspire us to explore the, on the boundaries of congestion control even more. I think the place that we started out with is, you know, uh, what, how far can we really go with a simple end host based congestion control. Just how far can it really mm -hmm. take us at scale is kind of where we started out with. Uh, but there is a lot to learn um, from the many schemes that this community has developed. Great. Thank you.